start. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Paul Valencia, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 22-23 New Coordinator Training Series October webinar from the California Department of Education. Today's webinar, we will focus on resources for student practice. Before we hand it off to our very knowledgeable presenters, we want to address a few housekeeping items. First, all participants are muted. Therefore, in order to submit your questions during the presentation, you may use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Please do not confuse this with the chat feature. For this webinar, we will only be using the Q&A feature. Um, also, please note, uh, there is an upvote feature. This allows you to vote on questions you'd like so you don't have to uh, submit duplicate questions. Plus, it lets the presenters know what questions are the most pressing. Second, a copy of today's note-taking guide was sent to you via email. If you haven't received it or need access uh, to it again, we can drop the link in the chat box and we'll be doing that throughout the presentation. Clicking on the link will take you to a folder uh, where you can download the guide or make a copy into your own Google Drive. There is no edit access from the link we shared, so therefore you will have to make your own copy. And lastly, we will be recording today's presentation. An archive of this presentation will be available to view on the training archive page of the CASP website. So with that, I'd like to introduce today's expert panelists. We're very fortunate to have with us Janine Penny from Palo Alto Unified School District and Aaron Gordon from San Diego County Office of Education. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Really excited to talk about student practice. So it is our pleasure to officially welcome you to webinar number three of the new coordinator training series for the 2022-23 school year. All right, so let's get started. Okay, what is our agenda for the next hour? Well, we will briefly cover why student practice is so important. Then we're going to jump right into the details around student practice. That includes the practice and training tests as well as the interim assessments. And lastly, we will assign you some homework. Yes, I said homework. <laughs> and then we're gonna answer your questions. So we have set some learning goals for today's presentation. By the end of the training, Participants will understand the purpose behind student practice, different ways students can practice in the system, and what planning is needed for each type of practice resource. And don't forget those checklists. So before we jump into today's topic, we want to remind everyone about the coordinator checklist. The, um, the CDE has created coordinator checklists, one for CASP and one for LPAC. These checklists, they help support the success of all LEA coordinators. And so th this is definitely one of those resources that you will want to use throughout the year. Um, links to the checklists are in your note-taking guide. And uh, the, the checklists are very detailed. They include key activities that you will need to do. Um, the tasks, they're listed by month and when they're most likely going to occur, but some tasks may occur during other months, depending on your local schedule. The checklist is downloadable. Um, it's a downloadable Microsoft Word document, so you can actually customize it to better meet your needs. And you can add tasks, remove tasks um, that might belong to someone else, and you can reorganize the activities. Finally, the, the, the checklists contain important links that take you to a source description that holds more details, or it tells you exactly what resource you need to accomplish that particular task. So the checklists are very, very helpful. All right, so now we want to remind you um, about this year-long training plan for new coordinators. Um, just to walk down memory lane here, in June, we held a full-day training for LPAC coordinators. 
which was hosted by about 15 county office of educations or COEs throughout the state. Then in July, we had our first new coordinator training webinar, which was all about receiving scores. Then in September, we had a full day training for CASP coordinators, which was also held by the 15 COEs across the state. And also September was webinar number two, a deep dive into accessibility. And then here we are, webinar number three in October on student practice. And looking forward um, in February, we'll be holding webinar number four on security incidents. In April, we will hold webinar number five on preparing for scores. And these webinars are supplemental, supplemented by additional full day trainings in November for LPAC and December for CASP. So we, we mentioned these trainings for a few reasons. First, if you are brand new, or you missed any of the previous trainings, you can always go back and you can watch the archived presentation videos. They're, they're all posted, or you can read the notes. The note-taking guides are there as well as the PowerPoints. The second reason we wanna remind you is we don't want you to forget to register for all of these upcoming um, opportunities. And they are optional, but highly recommended. And they're really meant to support you through your first year in this role with that just-in-time information. So the links to register are also in your note-taking guide. All right, let's get started. So we're gonna start with the why to help us understand the importance of student practice. So practice is an important piece in preparing students and staff for testing. By utilizing available resources, students and staff gain familiarity with the testing platform and they become more comfortable with different item types, learn how to utilize embedded accessibility supports and understand how to navigate within the system. It is best practice to build familiarity with the testing system prior to the summative testing. Practice will reduce the number of system usage errors and security administration incidents, reduce apprehension in the process, and really reduce the test anxiety in students. And it ultimately provides for a smoother summative testing experience. There are resources for student practice that are available to students, teachers, parents, administrators, so anyone can practice, not just the students. Okay, so we're going to start with the practice tests and the training tests as resources for student practice. And actually, let's start with the training tests. So the goal of the training tests is to help students become familiar with the testing interface and the available accessibility resources. And just a side note, when I talk about accessibility resources, if you weren't able to catch webinar number two on the deep dive, accessibility resources, we're talking about the universal tools, designated supports and accommodations. Um, so that's what we're referring to. Um, it gives students a, um, a familiarity with, with using those accessibility resources because they're all available in the training tests. So there are fewer items on the training tests than the practice tests, and there are no scoring guides available for the training tests. However, like I mentioned before, students can practice using those accessibility resources. So next we have practice tests. And the goal of the practice test is to expose students, parents, teachers, test administrators, test examiners to the tests. So they become familiar with the format and structure of the summative assessment. Now practice tests provide students with grade level specific experience and are available for each grade level that is tested. Scoring guides are available for the practice tests, but the, the tests themselves are not automatically scored, regardless of how they're administered. 
And, it, and just like the, the training tests, students can also practice using accessibility resources with the practice tests. So practice and training tests, the, um, they're available for Smarter Balance summative assessments for ELA and mathematics, the California Alternate Assessments or CAAs for ELA, mathematics and science, the California Science Test or CAST, the California Spanish Assessment or CSA, the Summative LPAC, there's one per domain, and the Alternate LPAC. So students can take a practice or training test at home or at school in an unmonitored environment or the teacher may launch a test session and have students access the test through the secure browser. By practicing that login and approval process, both the teacher and the student gain experience together with the testing platform. And it's best to have the student practice using the secure browser that they'll be using during the summative testing. And remember the for the uh, California alternate assessment and the alternate LPAC, administration is one-on-one -on -one using the directions for administration, which we call the DFAs. So there are resources available to support you in administering a practice test. In your note-taking guide are links to the quick reference guides. These guides, they walk you or whoever you share them with through that process of accessing the, the practice tests. And there are also scoring guides available for the practice tests. The practice tests are not scored, as I mentioned before, they're, they're not scored automatically. Um, that would have to be done by hand, and it's an option, but not, not mandatory. Um, scoring guides, they provide details about this, the test items themselves, student response types, the correct responses, and how test items align with the state standards. There, the answer keys and the performance task rubrics are also available. So all of these resources can be really valuable for teachers. Now the, the LPAC practice test can also be, get, it can be given online, but there's also a PDF version of each test um, available to download from LPAC.org. And as a reminder, the links to the resources are in your, your uh, note-taking guide. So Smarter Balanced has released a tool that is a great way to understand how Smarter Balanced assessments are evaluated and scored. This tool is a great resource. It's called the Smarter Balanced Annotated Response Tool, so SMART. Um, so this tool is a great resource to share with educators in your LEA. Uh, SMART can support professional development so that teachers understand what to look for when reviewing student writing and practice scoring using the rubrics with their colleagues. This publicly available online tool can be used as part of the hand scoring training to access examples of student responses for each available score point on the Smarter Balance rubric. And the link is also available in your note taking guide. But we wanna point out here that this tool is only available for ELA. And users can access sample items. They can review a range of response types, explore interactive scoring rationales and rubrics and practice the actual scoring. So this can be shared back at your sites as an extra practice. And the biggest benefit is sharing student responses without risking exposure to secure materials. So it's a great resource. And now I'm going to actually turn um, the slides over to my colleague, Janine, who will share about the interim assessments. Great. Thanks, Erin. Our next resource for practice are the interim assessments. We want to acknowledge that this is a switch from the student practice with the online system to student practice with content. Although a secondary benefit of using the interims is that students get to experience with and exposure to the testing interface for the end of year Smarter Summative assessments. 
Let's start with some information about the interim assessments. Interim assessments provide teachers with information on student performance to help gauge the knowledge and skills of students. The Smarter Balanced Assessment System has three parts, formative, interim, and summative, that are intended to work together to promote student learning and college career readiness success. Remember, interim assessments are optional assessments available for free to all California local educational agencies and support teaching and learning in many ways. Currently, interim assessments are only available for ELA and mathematics. Unlike summative assessments where item difficulty is adjusted based on student answers, the interims are fixed form assessments and are not computer adaptive. Therefore, all students will be asked to answer the same set of test questions on the interims. There is one version for each assessment, so students will be seeing the same items when or if the test is administered again. Keep this in mind so students aren't exposed to the same assessment too many times. Why would a school want to use the interim assessments as part of their overall plan for assessing student progress? Some reasons include to inform progress towards mastery of standards, to experience item types, to familiarize students and teachers with a testing interface and accessibility resources. With the interims, educators can access item level information in the California Educator Reporting Systems, SIRS. This includes student responses and correct answer, distractor analysis, standard claim and target information, as well as depth of knowledge, DOK. With interim assessment resources, teachers become more familiar with the content being assessed, the item types that students will encounter, and the rubrics or scoring criteria that will be used to evaluate their progress. Interims are used to monitor progress of students, but they also are also powerful professional learning tools for educators to build their knowledge and capacity. There are over 200 interim assessments available. Another resource, tools for teachers, can be used with interim assessment results to provide teachers with instructional resources based on the content of the specific interim assessment box. There are three types of interim assessments. Focused interim assessment blocks, focused IABs, are the most granular of the interim assessments, and they assess one to three targets in math and ELA literacy. The focused IABs cover a smaller amount of learning content or targets as compared to the other types of interim assessments. These are also known as a Rubik's cube with only two blocks shaded to show they have the fewest amount of targets assessed. Interim assessment blocks, IABs, assess one to eight targets. These are shorter assessments compared to the comprehensive assessments targeting specific instructional content and generally can be completed in one class period. They are shown as a Rubik's cube with only eight blocks shaded. Interim comprehensive assessments, ICAs, assess the same range of standards as well as the same item types format as the summatives. They are shown as a Rubik's cube with all 27 blocks shaded to show they assess the same targets as the summatives. The interim assessments may be administered at any grade level to any student, so teachers can give these assessments to students outside of their own grade level. The interims may be administered either in a standardized or non-standardized way, meaning they can be administered in a traditional setting where students are working individually and quietly, or students might work on test items with other students, such as in pairs or small groups. The teacher might even lead a whole class lesson while displaying an interim test item like a standalone question or a short response question or performance task. This provides educators with the flexibility to use IAs as best suits their instructional needs. Again, we want to reiterate that California Education Code section 60642.7b 
prohibits the use of interim assessments for any high stakes purposes, such as course placement, identification as gifted or talented, or reclassification of English learners. Another important note is that interim assessments are copyrighted, so they may not be posted into third party platforms. They may only be used within the systems provided by the CDE. For 22-23, the interims continue to be available for remote administration without the use of the secure browser. The link for how to administer interim assessments remotely is in your note-taking guide. There are many resources to help with administering the interim assessments that we wanna call your attention to. Links to all these resources are in your note-taking guide. First up are the interim assessment at a glance flyers. The interim assessments at a glance is a five page document produced by the CDE. As its name suggests, it is meant to provide a quick look at the approximately 200 IAs that are available. It's organized by content area, two pages for ELA and three pages for math, and then by grade level within each content area. Next, we have the interim assessment by grade flyers. For a more in-depth information about which interims are available for each grade, we have this document, which is 16 pages and is organized by grade. For each grade, it lists the available interim assessments, including the name of the assessment, the claim and the targets assessed, that's great, and the number of items on the test, and the number of items that require hand scoring, which can be a factor in choosing which assessments to use um, since all hand scoring must be done locally. All ICAs require hand scoring, but most IABs, including the focused IABs, do not. There, there is the interim assessment user guide and video series. This guide is web-based format and should make it much easier to search for, copy and paste, and pr uh, print the desired content. Also available to teachers with Tom's accounts is the IA viewing system. The viewing system allows teachers to view any IA at any grade level and plan how to best use them. Teachers might even use the viewing system to project IA items for non-standardized whole class instruction. The interim assessment button on the CASP website homepage leads to links to the viewing system, scoring guides and exemplars, access to the California Educator Reporting System SIRS, and an online system for hand scoring performance tasks and other constructed response items for teachers who you, you wish to use them in a standardized format. There's an item viewer in Tools for Teachers, which allows users to view individual items as opposed to the whole test. And remember, there is a direct link between the interim assessments and the Tools for Teachers. Most information on that, we recommend reviewing the notes in the September full day new coordinator training. There are some distance learning situations in the state. There are fewer situations than over the last few years. Um, so we wanna note that the practice tests, training tests, and interim assessments can all be used to support teaching and learning in the remote testing environment. There are some considerations that should be discussed and planned for regarding the use of the resources during remote testing. Practice and training tests are public facing, therefore they have less restrictions for use and can be easily reviewed using a shared screen or in breakout rooms. Interim assessment use is a bit more complex. Start by becoming familiar with the support documentation on the interim assessments page of casp.org. The link to this page is in your note taking guide. Once you are familiar with the process, there are a few questions to consider for remote testing. These include, how will you securely provide SSID numbers to students in preparation for testing? Private chat, secure in-district email, parent or student portal? Will the test be administered in small groups or in whole class settings? 
Remember that they must be used synchronously with the teacher for proctor monitoring testing. Do you need to provide resources for students to use such as scratch paper? And how will scratch paper be securely destroyed? Small whiteboards are great for this purpose. How will your teachers monitor interim assessment testing if it is being used for standardized administration purposes? And how will accessibility resources be accessed and used by students? Another resource that may be of assistance in determining how to use these materials remotely is the Smarter Balanced Remote and Hybrid Teaching and Learning webpage located at the link in your note-taking guide. This page has a number of considerations, some do's and don'ts for administering the tests and other tips on how to conduct formative assessment through distance learning. The link is in your note-taking guide. And we have one last thing to do before we get to all of your questions and that is assign your homework. I promise that we will not be assigning busy work. Instead, we want to focus you in on the tasks that have some next steps for you to accomplish. So first up, we want you to explore the resources we shared with you today and come up with a plan to share them out with your sites. And then we want you to find out what plan sites have to include student practice and how you can help. Offer to help sites create plans to make the process as easy as possible. And now I'm going to pass it to Paul to kick off our Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you, Janine. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, now we want to uh, answer any questions you might have. We will spend uh, the next part of this training answering your questions. Um, and we're gonna start with the questions that have already come in. So please send any additional questions by entering them into the Q&A box. Let's just take a look here. And actually, Paul, I see um, one question that I could address first. Okay. Um, if a student does not test with a correct accommodations during the IABs and they have an IEP, does a STAIRS report need to be completed? No, you do not need to complete a STAIRS report in that situation. You would if it were the summative assessment. And one option would be to um, provide another IAB using the accommodation so that the student can um, learn how to use it, practice using it, and see if it makes a difference um, with their result. Wonderful. And, and can I add something with the um, IABs, or the, the, that's the interim assessment blocks, or even the ICAs? Um, the teacher has the ability in the testing interface to, um, to put in those designated supports or accommodations it doesn't have to be put in TOMS. And, and that, that feature is available for teachers so they can test out some of those accessibility resources to see if they are appropriate for the child before making those firm decisions, putting them into TOMS so that they're, they're available for the summative assessment. So it's really, there's some flexibility that doesn't exist with the summative assessments that does exist with the um, interim assessments. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, someone asks, uh, how come the data on SIRS is different from the data on the ETS website? Not too far off, but a point or two. So I'll I'll chirp in, and then I'll, I'll I'm, I'm hoping that Janine will will chime in after I attempt to answer the question. So in SIRS, it's more of a dynamic. Um, uh, reporting system that really um, CalPADS, it feeds into SIRS. Um, and so there is a filter when you're extracting the results in the district um, or school export where you can hide additional results of students that are enrolled with you but didn't test with you. Um, however, because it is dynamic and fed through CalPADS, um, you might have some discrepancies in your accounts because the file in, there's actually a couple things you can do in, in um, TOMS, but for CASP, 
The data extract is really based on students who are enrolled with you at the end of your testing window. And LPAC is a little bit different because you can pull in results for students who are with you now. So um, each test has its different rules and criteria. And so that could be why your numbers are a little off. And I'm going to ask Janine if you have anything to add to that. I don't I don't think so. Um... But yeah, the, the, I think the, the piece that it's dynamic is a is an important piece. And so comparing that to what the state has posted publicly, there are some differences. And also depending on where you're looking in SERS, um, <clears throat> numbers could be a little bit different, but there's no reason to panic unless things are significantly different than you would want to reach out to the CDE. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, we have this uh, next one. This person says that they use IABs as district benchmark assessments. If a student does not test with the correct accommodations during the IABs and they have an IEP, does a STAIRS report need to be completed? I think that question was duplicated. Yes, I, um, yeah. I think that was the one we answered yes before. Yeah. Wonderful, okay. All righty, so here's the next one. Uh, do students need their TOMS login for any of the practice or training tests, or is it only if the teacher administers it through the secure browser? So you have two choices, really. Um, and this is the beautiful thing about the practice and training tests. You can log in as a guest from a regular web browser, and you can do that from home, your students can do it, your parents, the parents of the students can log in and see what the test is all about. So you can do that without your SSID in that test session. Now, if you want to, to replicate that login um, experience and that approval experience, creating a test session, you do have the ability to do that as well in the classroom and the teacher can um, create a test session and then the student would log in with their SSID and their name. And so they could go through the secure browser, but you have that option. And that's the beautiful thing where other people outside the classroom can take a look at the different um, test items and get a feel for the, the, the assessments. So you can do both. Thank you. Is there a practice test scoring guide available for the practice LPAC? Yes, there is. And so you would go to where the scoring guides, all the resources for teachers, um, and you um, would pull up the grade level, um, uh, the practice LPAC assessment that you'd like to look at. And there are, there are, there's DFAs, the directions for administration. Um, but then below you'll find these um, actual um, scoring guides. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think uh, this one was answered earlier. Can students use practice test at home? Yes. Okay. All right, we have another one. Um, are the practice and training tests also one fixed form? That's correct. Um, there's just one fixed form for the each of the grade levels or grade spans. Nice. Okay, this person says, I'm a new coordinator. Can interim assessments used for special education children be they used can. for special yeah, they're designed for all students, um, not appropriate for students who are assigned the alternate assessments. Um, there are not interim assessments for the alternate assessments. And I think that goes to the point that we were talking about with the accessibility resources. It would be great to try out the accessibility resources with the students in advance of summative and teachers can um, have control over that initially. And if you're unsure of a particular accessibility resource, and it's not assigned yet in the IEP, this is a great opportunity to try that out to see how it works for the student. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, this person asked if uh, the PowerPoint will be available and it will be. 
um, after this uh, session, I will drop the PowerPoint in with the same link as the note-taking guide. All right, next one. How early should students and families be notified about student practices for CASP? Well, you'll notice this webinar is in October. It's not the month before the spring summative um, assessment window. And it's intentional because student practice should be early on in the beginning of the, the school year. And um, so I say the earlier, the better. Thank you. All right, uh, where can we get the key to check the IABs? So there, I'm thinking, and maybe Erin, you can chime in. Um, I believe hmm, in, so in Tom's, I think in the secure or um, resources, um, in addition to the uh, the scoring for the the hand scored um, uh, items, uh, you can also and this was in the past, so I haven't looked at it this year, but they also included the answer keys for all of the items that are scored by by the machine in addition to the hand scored items. But it's in the, it used to be in a, um, the secure resources in Tom. So it is a password protected. Um, um, it would be Tom's that you would find that resource. And after the students have taken the IABs in SIRS, you'll be able to easily see what the yep. correct answers are. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, this person asked, do you know when we will find out if remote testing will be allowed for students for the SBAC? SB, for oh, the, the Smarter Balance? balance. Assessments. It sounds like it's my understanding that it, it is permitted because that's, we know that there are still um, distance learning environments. And so there are resources posted um, about the remote testing process. Also, keep your eyes out for um, upcoming webinars getting into um, the summative testing, and they'll reiterate the resources that are available to, to plan for that in the remote environment. Erin, do you want to add anything to that? No, but it, they um, remote testing is available this year for 2022-23. So, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this person asked, uh, yes, rubrics, answer keys, and exemplars are available in the secure resources in TOMS. Thank you for verifying. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> I wasn't guess. I, I was I was uh, going off of memory. So thank you for, for confirming that. All right. Um, that's pretty much it. We have a few more minutes or so if anybody wants to submit a question. All right. I guess we can move on then. All right. Oh, oh wait. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, Amy. Uh, okay, so this person's asking, does anyone know when LEA is assigned to Form 2 for the CAA will know if they are required to do a second scoring? I feel like I checked the website recently, and now I'll check maybe while Paul is finishing up the last few slides just to confirm that that's going, second scoring will be posted in the fall. But let me double check that while you're while you're finishing up, Paul. I can okay. look on the website. All righty. So to wrap it up, uh, we would like to promote the next two upcoming training opportunities. Uh, we have two full day trainings under the new coordinator umbrella. The first one is in November, and that's for the LPAC. And the second is in December for the CASP. 
These are hosted by 15 COEs across the state. So hopefully you can find one nearest you. The link is in the note-taking guide to register. Uh, this link will take you to the training opportunities webpage where you can find registration links to these trainings under the month they will happen. All right, also we have the November coffee session and they're happening on November 8th and they're from two to three. Uh, these virtual coffee sessions hosted by the CDE and ETS will offer opportunities for LEA staff to ask questions and get answers about assessments, trainings, resources, and more. Coffee sessions are entirely dedicated uh, to answering questions about assessments and topics of interest from testing coordinators and providing timely updates. The link is also in the note-taking guide. And real quick, Paul, I think they changed the date for just the November. Um, it's not on a Tuesday this month. The coffee oh. session, because of election day, they're having it on the Wednesday. So it's unique for November. Usually it's on a Tuesday, um, but I'm pretty sure. Um, okay. Yeah. I so will. I wanna, um, it's the yeah, No, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. And I will update this PowerPoint. And uh, when I submit it, it'll say November 9th. Thank you, Aaron. All right. So the next one, uh, we have the November pretest virtual training. And this is happening on November 17th from 2 to 4. This is part of the 22-23 pretest virtual training series, which provides coordinators with the information needed to successfully prepare for and administer the CASP and LPAC. Uh, once again, the link is in the note-taking guide. And lastly, as always, if you haven't already, we would like you to register for the assessment spotlight emails. These were covered in the June LPAC training and the July CASP welcome webinar. Instruction on how to subscribe are in the note-taking guide. If you want another way to hear about assessment updates, please follow the CDE Assessment Division on Twitter at CDE Assessments. And that brings us to the end of our training. We hope that the information we shared today was helpful and timely. As always, we recognize the hard work and dedication and thank you for your commitment and invaluable contributions toward helping your LEAs and more importantly, the students. We couldn't achieve this without you. Uh, you can reach out through the networks of coordinators in similar roles throughout the state, your LEAs, success agents, and you always have staff at the CDE ready and available to answer your questions. With that, on behalf of CDE, uh, myself, Paul Valencia, the trainers, Janine Penny and Aaron Gordon, and my colleague, Aaron, uh, Amy Myers, we thank you for joining us and please reach out if you have any questions. Have a great day.